Championship Wrestling. Bringing you great wrestling action. Sanctioned by the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance. That was a good show. All right, let's talk about the Championship Wrestling Show. NWA Championship Wrestling, July 19th, 1986. Still on tour with the Bash. So we were not in the studio this week. We were in Columbia, South Carolina, where Tony Schiavone and David Crockett were ringside, and Bob Cottle and Jim Cornette were handling interviews in the back. I love that their ringside setup is they're sitting in chairs in front of a desk, and they're both holding handheld mics. Yes. Didn't even have headsets. No. Like a real sport. <laughs> they're holding their wacky, <laughs> Price is Right, long-ass mics, talking into it, and doing commentary. Whatever, whatever works for you. I guess so. You know what did not work for me? Don Kernodal versus Golden Terror. Now would be a good time to mention that over the last couple of weeks, they've had a lot of meetings regarding the draft. If you did not listen to today's Observer Live, or you've not been at WWE.com or our website, all of the rules of the draft have been posted. Who gets the first pick? Raw gets three picks for every two SmackDown picks because the show is longer. All of this other rigmarole. Still stuff that has not been announced, which probably means it hasn't been decided, such as what's going on with the announcers. Are there going to be two women's titles? Seems to be. Anyway, one of the things talked about is we're splitting up these rosters, and they announced that there will be six NXT call-ups. Mm -hmm. That's not a lot. We're taking a full roster, and we're cutting it in half, and we're adding three people to each side. Less than half. Raw's getting 60% plus three. SmackDown is getting 40% plus three, or whatever. No, you're right. So anyway, I'm talking about doing squash matches again. And we're not talking about the squash match where the social outcasts are dressed as the presidents on the 4th of July for a one-move bullshit thing. We're talking about local talent will show up, and they will go in the ring, and the superstars will do all of their moves, beat the shit out of them, and that'll be that. You're probably going to see more squash matches on these shows. Good. I hope so. I hope it's good. But anyway, the point of this is, this match was Don Kernodal and the Golden Terror, and the fucking fans were into it. <laughs> in what universe was I living in here? It was odd. It was not just odd. Let me tell you something. David Crockett at one point, they went on and on and on and on and on and on and on, the wrestlers. And Tony starts talking about how Carnotal is winded. <laughs> He's getting tired. And he keeps saying this over and over. And I'm like, well, in the fucking match then if the guy's tired. So they do a backslide and the ref won't count. This is where I lost my mind. This motherfucking ref wouldn't count because the fucker's legs were in the ropes. I'm just like, finish this match. So... The match goes on, and Tony Schiavone then screams, both men won't give in. They keep kicking out, David. And David says, nothing. Because I think David Crockett, the biggest fan in the history of wrestling, fell asleep during this fucking match. I have no other explanation for it. Ten seconds of dead silence. Yeah, they went... It's not enough that they went forever... There was no signs of even building to a finish. This was an eternity of the middle of a match. And in fact, it was joined in progress. So I can't tell you how long this actually went. But I can tell you the bell rang to end the match 10 minutes and 30 seconds into the show. Which means the match went at least 11 minutes. And somehow these fans were totally into it. Golden Terror, who never, ever, ever gets offense except this match. And Don Kernodal, who sometimes gets offense but never actually wins in 1986. But the fans were totally into this match. It sucked. It was long. It was boring. Kernodal won with a horrible clothesline. I will say there was a spot here I don't think I've ever seen where Terror is on offense and he grabs Kernodal by the head and he hits a headbutt and he lets go and he teeters backwards and he falls to his back. I've seen this before. Usually with Samoans. You, maybe that's, yeah. Maybe that's why it's caught me off guard because I haven't seen him do it to a white wrestler before. But Samoans, you headbutt a Samoan, you sell. I see guys sell. I've never seen anyone do the nest he plunge like this. So anyway, Don Carnotto won a horrible match that went forever and ever and ever. Jim Cornette cut a promo about how big and bad Big Bubba was. How Dusty Rhodes had Dusty Rhodes had learned this firsthand. 
He's going to learn it even more in the future. I was distracted. I cannot focus on what Jim Cornette was saying because I was captivated by Bob Cobble's comb over. It wasn't just his comb over, although that was astonishing. Cornette is burying everybody. He buries everybody, including Baby Doll, calling her ugly and fat and whatever he's calling her. And as he is burying all of the baby faces, Bob Cottle cannot help himself. He's laughing. Yes. <laughs> he's howling with laughter at Jim Cornette. I remember way back in the 80s, way back in the 80s, and I used to watch primetime wrestling. And you had Bobby Heenan and Gorilla Monsoon. They would do their comedy bit. And Bobby was funny. And I thought, man, he's a bad guy. I think he's funny. But all the other fans, they must surely hate Bobby Heenan. And then one day, Primetime Wrestling moved to a studio setting where they had a live studio audience. And Bobby Heenan would do all of his heel comedy stuff, and the fans would laugh. And I was like, God, this ruins it. <laughs> it was no fun to know that everybody else laughed at Bobby Heenan. You know what I mean? Sure. You shouldn't be laughing at Jim Cornette when he's a heel, being an asshole. You should be appalled, like G like Gene Okerlund would always be appalled. Yes. He would never be laughing when somebody denigrated some female wrestler or ballet. The Warlord versus Vernon Deaton. First of all, we're going to spend way, way, way more time talking about this match than the actual match itself. Was. I hope not. <laughs> what? I started to say, except the crowd went nuts. Yeah. He was big, strong, and ugly. Uh -huh. All he could do was a power slam. Yeah. And they loved it. He they was absolutely fucking horrible. He loved it. It was god awful. We haven't even talked about his music yet. This is not music to fight to or to lord over, over a war to. This is music for a soothing Sunday drive or maybe a nice time out on a boat. It was very relaxing, soothing music for the war lord as he went into combat. He went into power slam. Everyone pissed themselves with glee at this giant lumbering around. Cornette interviewed the Andersons. They're there to hype up a bunkhouse match against the Rock and Roll Express, which is going to be to name top contenders to the tag titles. It would be the last uh, Green American Bass show. So Arne says, we're going to use every weapon we can get our hands on. And he's got his cowboy boot in his hand. And he's you know slapping the heel into his mitt to show how big and heavy it is and how much it's going to hurt when he hits Ricky Morton in the head with it. That only walks in with something. <laughs> it was metal. It had a wheel. That's all I can tell you. I think he tore something off a clown car. Or a bed. I don't know what this was. A bed? What kind of bed do you sleep in? I've had a bed. Willy Wonka's I've bed? I've had a bed that had a wheel on it. This was straight out of a chocolate factory. I don't know what the hell this was. So he's saying if we cheat like normal in a, or if we cheat like crazy in a normal match, imagine how violent we're going to be when there are no rules. He was so ugly and gruff. He was a gruff man. <laughs> Just a great heel. He was the gruffest wrestler I've seen in many a day. That's a great word for Owen Anderson. Gruff. He was, he was gruff. He That's was, exactly what he was. Yes. And and he should have been a, a badass mean heel. He was. Because he was ugly. That's how things worked back in the day. <laughs> yes, it did. If you were small and pretty, you were a baby face. And if you were big, gruff, and ugly, you were a heel. Except the warlord. Crusher Crusoe versus Todd Champion. But he was strong. He was strong. He was he like a superhero. He was. He was a force of nature. Ole Anderson did not look like Superman. No, he did not. <laughs> no. Trying to figure out who he might have looked like. Crusher Krusev versus Todd Champion. They were talking about how great the bash had been and what a great show this was here in Columbia, the capital of South Carolina. David Crockett says, one of these years, we're going to get a bash show in all 50 state capitals. Man, I can't wait till the bash comes to fucking Olympia. Fuck Olympia, that at least is a city. It is It is within an hour's drive of Seattle. They can do a bash show in Carson City, Nevada? Sure. You can do a bash show in Cheyenne, Wyoming? Yeah, why not? Because it's Cheyenne, Wyoming. Well, the bash is an American institution, Vinny. You can go anywhere. I guess if so. If Cheyenne is good enough for the fucking state capital, it's good enough for the great American bash. So all they did in this entire match was hammer locks and arm ringers. And somehow, A, the crowd was going crazy for ev everything they did, and B, both men were just totally drenched in sweat. And this is when I determined that this building must be a thousand degrees, because they're doing nothing, and they're dripping with sweat. It went on forever, not as long as the Don Canoto match. But they're a fucking commercial. Yeah. Couldn't even believe it. It was boring, though not as boring as the Don Canoto match. And Khrushchev won with a terrible sickle. Ugh. 
Put the sick in sick. <laughs> I, I was sick when I watched this match and finish. This show has replays, which is good because I was I almost nodded off before this finished. I had no idea how he won. Coddle interviewed Dusty Rhodes and Baby Doll. Thank God he was here. Dusty sometimes, and I won't even say sometimes, I would say 80% of the promos he cuts on TV are just, he gets by on delivery alone. Sure. He has not a, not, nothing to say. This time he had something to say. He was building up the match with Ric Flair. It was going to take place in the steelest cage in the history of the world. <laughs> That's an awesome line. Yes. Dusty, this was such a fabulous promo by Dusty Rhodes, probably because it was following Todd Champion and Crusher Khrushchev. Mm-hmm. And I also remember it finally because it was followed by Nelson Royal and Mitch Snow. Dusty's final line was to, he's going to win the world title, win the world title a third time. And then doctors, senators, and Indian chiefs would have to admit he was still in his prime. All right, let's review this uh, card we've seen so far. The hand jive. Willie and the hand jive. That's where he got that line. I see. Let's review the matches, the action we've seen leading to this next match. If you could only have seen Vinny's face when I just (laughs) shouted hand jive in the middle of that statement he was making. We saw Don Kernodal versus Golden Terror for 10 plus minutes. We saw Warlord versus Vernon Deenan for less than a minute, let's be fair. We saw Crusher Crusher versus Todd Champion for I don't know, but it went way too long. And then we were treated to Nelson Royal versus Mitch Snow. You know what's funny about this match? This match was proof that the fans don't like everything. No! (laughs) Because after about the third fucking headlock by Mitch Snow, the fans... In 1986, on the Great American Bash Tour, who had been so into a match involving Don Kernodal and the Golden Terror, they began to boo. And I thought, Jim Cornette's got to be coming to ringside. They can't possibly be booing the match. But in fact, I believe they were booing the match. They booed Mitch Snow's headlock. Now, to be fair, I hated this. (laughs) Until about three minutes into the match, they had done a headlock for what seemed like all three minutes. And suddenly they did one very simple high spot where Mitch did a body slam because he sucked. And then he went for another body slam because he sucked. And because in real life and storyline he sucked, when he went for the same move twice... The old veteran Nelson Royale rolled him up with a small package and pinned him. And suddenly, I loved it. (laughs) Nelson Royale pins Mitch Snow in a terrible match that got boos from a crowd that would never boo anything. He pins him, and Tony Schiavone screams, what a great win. (laughs) You know what? It was a great win. Liar. Oh, come on. So we are four matches into this now, and way more than a half hour into the te- television program, and the biggest star we had seen actually wrestling in the, wing, in the ring was Smash before he was Smash. Mm. There was no star power. There were no famous wrestlers on the show. Cornette interviewed Tully Blanchard and J.J. Dillon. Tully noted that everyone's goal these days was to take out one of the horsemen or another, and none of them would ever get it done. And they promised that with nothing but a taped fist, they were going to knock Ronnie Garvin out. Time for the Great American Bash update. I swear to you, the low-definition, low-res fireworks display was the best thing on the show so far. Because of the damn song. It was a happy country song playing. He said Magnum was down... Magnum TA was down 3 nothing in his best-of-seven series with Nikita. He plugged the Atlanta show, the last bash, on August 2nd. And there were a bunch of autographs and giveaways that fans showed up at Gate J... It was made very clear, Gate J in Atlanta's, I think, Fulton County Stadium, maybe the Omni. But that's where you go to get all the free stuff. So the Rock and Roll Express come in for a promo. And I know we say this every week, but I'm reminded of it every week. Why did Robert Gibson ever speak? He rarely did. And when he did, he usually screwed it up. (laughs) Yeah. He immediately screwed up whether the Andersons were cousins or brothers. Then he couldn't remember what weapons they had. and it um, it was. But you didn't know either. Well, I guess I didn't know either, but... All I know is it was Robert Gibson talking, and then they turned, to, they turned to Ricky Morton, and guess what? He was awesome. He made me excited to go see the Green American Bash in Atlanta 30 years ago at Gate J. So it's going to be great action, great wrestling, quality southern rock from the Gator Tail Band and Dave David Allen Coe. 
Man, I was excited. <laughs> I was thinking it's to like the most fun thing in the entire summer. Sam Houston versus Tully Blanchard. Thank God, a star, <laughs> an actual star on this wrestling show. This was so great. If you're a modern day wrestler and you don't watch these old shows, you got to go back to this one right here and watch a classic babyface versus heel professional wrestling encounter where the fans lived and died with every single thing that happened in the match. It sounds like a cliche, but that's what happened here. These fans went crazy when Sam Houston bounced Tully all over the place like a ping pong ball. Tully, from the get-go, and I literally from the opening bell, because the gimmick was he didn't want to give up his belt to the referee, and the referee had to yank it away from him. So the bell finally rings, and Houston immediately starts school boiling him, school boying him, and backsliding him and going for cradles, and the fans are pissing themselves at all these near falls. And then Tully gets up and he starts ping ponging all around as he made Houston look like the most dangerous man in the world, and the fans thought, oh my god, we're gonna see a championship change hands. Wow. Yes, huge news. Eventually the horsemen had to cheat to take over because they were evil. Most of the heat was just Tully throwing him out of the ring, making him fight to get back in. And Sam made his comeback. Mostly punching, and until he cut him off and won with a slingshot suplex. Awesome. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, Tully is the better man. Yes. But young, plucky Sam Houston, goddamn, did he do his best? He, and he he he's a better man because of it. And the fans respect. That's him. right. He gave it his all. That's he, right. And this, this is this is actually important for uh, the way the match is set up from the get go and and the aftermath. Everyone knew. That Tully, uh, well, yeah, the Tully Blanchard was the favorite. It was an uphill battle for Sam Houston. Sam Houston was punching above his weight. Is that the uh, cliche? He was climbing a hill. Yeah, yeah. That he died upon. Yeah, he, he 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 took on one hell of a challenge here, and that made that's part of what made it so exciting when they thought he may get the upset right away. This is, he caught Tully off guard. This may be his only chance to win this title. So. It was great, and, and then by the end, as noted, Tully proved he was, in fact, the better man, as we all knew all along. And it's okay for heels to win clean sometimes. Yes, because, number one, you want to give them some credibility, and yes. number two, if the fans really are living and dying with everything, then when the heel wins clean, when he was right, it really pisses you off. That's true. Think about somebody you hate. And you have some sort of argument, and it turns out he's right. You don't suddenly think, well, I like this man now. Oh, no. You think, <laughs> fuck you, motherfucker. God damn it. That's what people thought when he won and beat the good guy that they all loved. Yes. Jim Cornette interviewed Khrushchev. Oh, fuck this. God bless the guy. I'm sure he's a nice guy. But as we talked about before, Nikita... And granted, he is a Russian sympathizer, Vinny, not an American sympathizer. You kept saying that the other day. Did I? Yeah. My He's bad. a Russian sympathizer. He's an American who sympathizes with Russia. Exactly. But the point of this is, Nikita was also, in real life, an American. But he tried to do a Russian accent, as did Ivan, who was a Canadian. This guy, as we noted, maybe the reason he was a sympathizer was because he could not, for the life of him, do a fake Russian accent. Well, as it turns out, he can't do a fake English accent either. He can't speak American. <laughs> he can't speak any language. This was so boring. Oh, my God. Yeah. This, this, <laughs> I was a huge demolition mark, and let me tell you something. Smash got better. Oh, yeah. He, he got, had room to grow. He got much better. Oh, this promo sucked. It's just terrible. Ran in all the baby faces in an incredibly boring manner. Said they're going to win the U.S. titles and regain the six-man titles, and it'll all be the Road Warriors' fault. And, and, Cottle interviewed Ronnie Garvin, <laughs> and this was great, too, because this is coming off the heels of that Tully Blanchard match. And Garvin said, you know, this shows once again that Tully Blanchard, he can take a hell of a beating. It's going to be a huge challenge for me to take him out and regain my national title. He looks in the camera and says, I don't want to disrespect Sam Houston. He's young. He's got a lot of heart, but he's got a lot to learn. And I would have wrestled a totally different match than Sam Houston did. And they showed at least a quarter of that match over again, maybe more. And Garvin's going through point by point and making pointing out all the mistakes Sam made. Here he's going for covers too early. You gotta you gotta hurt Tully Blanchard if you're gonna beat him. He's not being aggressive enough. And here he's he's punching. He just keeps throwing punches. Eventually Tully's gonna know that punch is coming. He's gonna block it, and there it goes. 
It was so awesome. And finally, uh, Garvin says that, again, someday he's going to get his hands on Talina tape fist match. He's going to knock him out. He's going to take that national title back. This is great. Then Cottle interviewed Magnum TA. His promo was very basic. Yes, I'm down 3-0, but I'm not going to quit. I'm still confident I'm going to get this done. Well, they made a very important point in this interview. They did not mention at all, when they did the thing earlier, that Magnum was down 0-3. to Yes. But apparently the Russians had cheated every single match. Uh, I'm sure they did. I guess we were just supposed to know that. But Magnum, without saying, without complaining about it, just made it very clear. Everybody who saw those matches knows why you're ahead three to zero and there's a long fucking way to go and goddamn i'm not gonna give up because i'm a winner uh, i'm not a loser i'm no, not a quitter not a qu- not said. a quitter yeah he's, he's not a quitter not a winner not a winner he's gonna fight he's gonna get his championship back he's gonna shut nikita's commie mouth he's gonna regain his u.s title and it's all gonna start in atlanta that was one hell of a promo that's a very good babyface promo a lost art yeah Rock and Roll Express versus the Andersons. Holy smokes. My Man, TV. I don't even know what to say about all this. I do. The sound I heard on my television when these baby faces sent the heels packing. It was astonishing. Are we sure your TV did not light on fire? The closest... For those of you that don't watch this stuff, you just like to listen to us talk about it. And God knows why you're not watching it, the way we talk about it. What, what the hell's wrong with you if you don't watch this? The closest that I can come up with... As an analogy nowadays to the reaction that the Rock and Roll Express got here, the closest I can come nowadays is John Cena. And there's nobody else close. And the biggest difference is everybody screams for John Cena, but then you also hear people booing. Yeah. That was not the case here. No. Nowadays, if you have a really good-looking guy and the women all love him, the men will turn on this man. Not 1986. These chicks loved, loved the Rock and Roll Express. And the men would take them to the hotel to be with the Rock and Rolls. Because they loved the Rock and Rolls as well. That's right. They respected these men. These men had peroxide in their hair. They had a lot of mullets. They had scarves everywhere. They sure dressed pretty, but goddamn, they could fight. And they fought in this match. Man, did they fight in this match. They did a time limit draw. I'm pretty sure it was 30 minutes. It was an outstanding 30 minutes. It was funny. After all those Ric Flair promos, I can confirm that a lot of Ricky Morton fans were, in fact, little girls in the training underwear. Although a lot of them were also grown women in normal underwear, too. And both were jumping up and down, screaming at every time they did anything positive. I couldn't believe the point where they cut off Robert, who, as we've noted many times, <laughs> he can't talk. He's the less charismatic, mm-hmm. he's not the good worker, but he's still beloved. Yes. The chicks were screaming at the top of their lungs, and he wasn't even fighting for a tag. He was laying there, <laughs> and they were losing their shit. Yes. So the spot early where you know the, the rock and rolls took the entire first five minutes, and part of this feud had been the incident where the horseman jumped Morton in the locker room and rubbed his face in the ground, and he had to wear that mask for weeks. So here, when uh, when Morton caught fire and started working over Arn's nose and was just doing face busters and DDTs and punches to the nose that an arm was selling, everyone's going nuts. Eventually, they cut Rick, uh, Robert off, as you noted. We got about 10 minutes of just arm bars and tease tags, and the place is just going crazy. Ricky ta- finally tagged in. I had to ask you to turn the television down. My ears were beginning to hurt. In 1986, Ricky Morton runs wild with Superman punches. He's making this comeback, and it was funny. Just in the process of throwing punches and having Arn bump around, Arn ended up bumping into his own corner, so Oli essentially had to tag in. He, he could not have not tagged in here. Everyone involved would look dumb. So Oli tags in, and Morton just beats his ass, too. Who cares? Whatever. And then they had a start of the match over. And <laughs> Rock and Roll started taking Oli apart, doing double teams and leg holds. They're talking about how Oli was on the shelf for months with a leg injury. Fans were chanting, break it, break it. And that got me to thinking, can you imagine if Pentagon Jr. had been around in this company in the 1980s? <laughs> that would have been weird. They even started cheating and fighting fire with fire, and the crowd loved that. And then finally, finally, Ricky Morton got cut off again, and then it was just 10 minutes of let's break this fucker's nose a second time. I loved it because 
the unreal fury when the heels stepped on Ricky's face. Can you imagine? They stepped on this man's face and tried to break his nose a second time. I can't believe nobody jumped the rail and tried to get into the ring and go after these fuckers. Ricky put him in an Indian death lock. Yes. And I don't remember who it was. Maybe it was Oli. I think it was, it was definitely Oli. Oli's kind of struggling for the corner. He's not even selling like he may give up, but man, David Crockett is going haywire. Not now! They're about to go to commercial. Not now! He may submit! He's screaming at the top of his lungs, we can't go to commercial right now! And Tony calmly explains, if something happens during the break, we'll do a replay. <laughs> yes. And they go right to commercial. Yes. Come back, he hasn't submitted. No, in fact, they were winning by that point when they came back. You know, another thing, looking back in the 80s, and it was mostly this building here. I mean, you see this sometimes nowadays, but it is much easier, even if you know it's not real, it is much easier to respect these wrestlers as athletes when you see them in the ring absolutely drenched in sweat, yeah. dripping sweat all over their opponents, looking like this is the battle of a lifetime. Oh, yeah. Even if it's not real, you know these men are great athletes, and they're working their asses off. That's right. And uh, similarly, similarly, when they actually gave Ricky time to sell, they're beating him, punching his nose, standing on his face, and all he can do is roll to the, ro- roll to the ropes and... And they bring the camera over to his face, and Ricky is grabbing his nose and moaning, and Arn and Oli just come over, and they just stand there, because it's time to let, give him time to sell and get over how much pain he is in. That's right. And that makes it more impressive when he fights back. This used to be something we didn't have to explain. <laughs> you know, that's true. <laughs> this used to be standard. Now it's revolutionary. So, the last few minutes were... I don't want to say a mess, but Gibson came in, I thought, without a tag, and then he just stayed in the ring and kept on wrestling, and uh, he hooks a sleeper, immediately the bell rings, because the time limit's expired. Ricky puts a sleeper on Oli for good measure, and uh, it was, in fact, a time limit draw, so there was no winner in this match, but 30 minutes and, let's say, 10 seconds into it, the Rock Roll Express had both men trapped in rear naked chokes, and then when they let go, the Andersons were the ones lying on the mat trying to get their bearings while the rock and rolls were standing tall and strong. So the fans were happy, even though it was a draw. That is the key. Oh. It didn't matter that... It didn't matter that they didn't win. They won. Yeah. They laid the men out with their sleepers, and they had their hand raised. These fans left this building here in South Carolina knowing... I know in my heart that Rock and Roll Express were the better men than the Andersons. That's right. They were, they, they, they did not get the win due to a technicality. Next time, those Andersons are in trouble. And what a setup for this bunkhouse match. Oh, yeah. With the weird looking pipe and whatever, <laughs> whatever else. That broad what is he had. So, the last few minutes of the show, Coronet cut a promo talking about how great the Midnight Express were and how he had beaten them. And then we had about two minutes of the Midnight Express versus Dusty Rhodes and Magnum TA. And those two minutes, by the way, Here's all that happened. The Dusty got in Big Bubba's face. They teased a Cornet baby doll fight. The Express started bumping around for Magnum punches and Dusty elbows and baby doll slaps. And they go to wrap up the show. And I don't know. A, a, a lot of people in wrestling in the 80s did a lot of drugs. I don't know if David Crockett was one of them. But it seemed as if. He had been taking cocaine for two hours straight, and it all hit him right here. <laughs> he was very excited. <laughs> he just screams, Tony! Tony, no! We gotta go! He was screaming at the top of his lungs. He was wailing. That you yes. were not going to get to see the rest we, of it. He we, was there. We, the fans, were being robbed, and he could not tolerate this injustice. That's right. That's right. So, I wrote at the end here, it was an up and down show. That's not right. This was It was more. all up. The, no. It started down, no. and it went up. This is one hour of zero and one hour of ten. I can't even say it was an average of five. This was two different shows. Well, Vinny, like I said, we started out watching the prelims, and then later we got to see the main events. Yes. So it was all up. We yeah. started low, and we went high. I want to get this line in here because I forgot to say it in the opener. The Don Cronodal match was, in fact, every UFC prelim you've ever seen, where it's very obvious two minutes in which of these fighters is better, but it still goes three full rounds. That's basically what happened. That's what it was. 
Anyway, although there are plenty of prelims I have seen that did not get the heat of that Don Carnotal versus Golden Terror match. I would say almost all of them. It's crazy. You're going to be mine all night long. I believe that right there is the song that, was it CNN had that they were going to play when the world came to an end? Yes. A Turner station, I might add, which carried NWA World Championship Wrestling, which we watched tonight. We sure did. Man, what a show that was. <laughs> that was a horrible fucking show. Although there was, there were a couple of things on there that I must talk about because of their greatness. There was five minutes of pure awesome in about an hour and 55 minutes of pure horror. It was quite bad. I'm actually going to make a command decision here, and normally we do Ring of Honor first. But I specifically saved last week's Ring of Honor and the new Ring of Honor because I know there's some people out there that think that the Ring of Honor booking is very boring. But let me tell you something. The last two weeks of Ring of Honor television, this fucking main event angle is awesome, and I am so glad that I've seen it. And we're going to save that for last, because I have a lot more fun and excitement to bring to that review than I have to bring to this NWA World Championship Wrestling review here on the final day of the Great American Bash Tour 1986. The one time I don't ask which show goes first, and you actually do switch it on me. Yeah. This is why I ask every time. Well, you know, if you've been paying attention, you would have known NASC earlier. Because three times a year, you will switch. Yeah, but not tonight. Yeah. No, you, you did know, tonight. I have concluded from watching that NWA show that they thought maybe there are some fans that are close enough that they could go to the final night of the bash, but maybe they're sitting at home thinking, you know, let's just stay in and watch NWA World Championship Wrestling on the Superstation instead. WTCG. And they wanted to convince those fans to get the fuck off the couch and get out of the house and go to the show live. They outright said that a few times. God. You can still make the drive. Damn this show. I wish I could have made the drive. I, I, any drive would be better than watching this show. So here's the deal, everyone. Every Saturday morning at Jim Crockett Promotions, they would tape a two hour, usually a two-hour show in their studio. And they tape a Saturday morning, and it would air Saturday afternoon slash evening around the country. So, the final bash was Saturday night at Fulton County Stadium, which was the old baseball stadium and football stadium. It was one of those horrible 1970s multi-purpose places. Anyway, it's a stadium in Atlanta, and it's that night. So, they had to tape this in the morning, and I guess they figured rather than do any live audience stuff, we will do a bunch of sit-down promos, we'll watch old matches, and we'll talk about them. And then in these sit-down promos, guys will have a lot of time to talk about the show tonight and try to talk people into that building. Now, let's keep in mind that this was going up on satellite. Yes. This could be seen all over the country. Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> what torture for everybody else. Jesus Christ. It started at the beginning <laughs> when my main man, who I am the biggest fan of, David Crockett, Revealed why so many people thought that David Crockett sucked. <laughs> so they go to a shot. It's the empty baseball stadium. And they're just doing slow pans to show how big this building is. And you hear David Crockett's voice. And, and I thought until the very end, I thought he was doing okay. He's talking about this. This All these stands will be full tonight as fans are here to watch history. This, this crowd in Atlanta is going to fill this baseball stadium. They're going to watch Dusty Rhodes, the new world heavyweight champion. He's going to make his title defense in a steel cage again against Ric Flair. And maybe tonight in the stadium, maybe Nikita Koloff will beat Magnum TA and win the U.S. title in their best of seven series. No, 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 no. No, no. He said that tonight was the grand finale. And the Nikita versus Magnum series, Nikita had three wins and Magnum had two. Yeah, I missed that. It was clarified later. No, Magnum had one. No, he had two. Because tonight he could tie it up. Or tonight, Nikita could win. Yes, Nikita. this is the key. Nikita could win tonight. Magnum couldn't. No, the key is, why is it the fucking grand finale? And what? it's not the last match. I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> they had 14 bash shows. He couldn't fit seven matches in there. The thing about David was, yes, he didn't do that bad. But he's still, like, early on, maybe it's just me. But it sounded like he couldn't remember some names. Probably. Because he said something like, tonight it'll be Nikita versus <laughs> one of the great baby faces of our era. Yeah. The Amer- Magnum TA. <laughs> I was like, is this that hard to remember, fucker? Couldn't do a second take? He couldn't, yeah, he couldn't do a second fucking take. This wasn't live. But he gets through it. <laughs> Barely. Barely. He's, he's through and he's done. And he says, you want to be here tonight, folks? It's going to be historic or something. And the camera starts to pan away and everything's fine. But he can't live well enough alone. And he has to shout out, awesome wrestlers. <laughs> awesome wrestlers. That was it. <laughs> God. Holy fuck. So they go to the studio where Tony's sitting by himself. Says the gates in Atlanta will be opening in just a few minutes. Get out of your seats, everybody. Go ahead, make the drive. Said that, yes, Dusty Rhodes had beaten Ric Flair for the world title. Also, there was a new bald man in the company, and it's Jimmy Valiant. I couldn't believe my ears. I'm afraid so. Like, sometimes I look and find out where things are going. Sometimes I remember, and sometimes I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know this was coming. I don't like spoilers for my 20-year-old wrestling television shows. 30, (laughs) that's right. (laughs) Jesus Christ. So, uh, he was joined by the Russians, Crusher, Khrushchev, and Ivan Koloff. Crusher says, first of all, he took the time to congratulate Dusty on his win, but said there was no way Dusty could defend two world championships at once, and this meant the Russians were sure to be six-man champions again very soon, and they would take those belts back to the Kremlin. Ivan called Dusty the great American troublemaker. He was going on about... He said it with such gravity. He, he, it was, the he, great he, American troublemaker. He wasn't making a joke when he said this. No. No. So he encouraged... He was like me. Brett when he calls a man a big, stupid dummy. He meant it. He was very serious about it. And then he did, quite literally, almost in these exact words, he advised the people at home, there's still time, you can still make it, jump in your cars, drive to the stadium so you can see Nikita win the U.S. title. That's right. His crush of Khrushchev was so horrible. Yes. He could not cut a promo in English. No. He could not do a fake Russian accent. No. I don't know why they didn't just claim he was a Russian who spoke no English, and he had to have Ivan speak for him. I don't have an answer. Maybe they figured if he gets enough practice, he'll eventually get better. And he did, but he had to totally switch companies and gimmicks to do it. That's right. He had to become whatever demolition was. (laughs) Which was not Russian. He had to become a repo man. No. (laughs) Before that. His his career really did have a low low beginning, a great peak, and a low end. He was a fake Russian. Mm Mm-hmm. And then he was a fake road warrior. Yes. And then he repossessed cars. And he was a golfer. And he was a golfer, that's right. truck driver. And then I think he quit. (sighs) Blacktop bully, that's right. Who's the golfer again? Mr. Hole-in-One. I don't even remember that. He was was on Saturday night in WCW. He came out in his golf uniform and he would, you know, pot. Can you imagine? (laughs) What What a career. It's amazing. Still a better career than Randy Barber, arguably Verdon Deaton, Definitely Mike Samani. So we saw the Russians versus these three geeks. So the thing about this show was... Oh. Up and down, almost without exception, they showed these matches, but they uh, they didn't want you to hear the commentary that's being done then, so they muted or near-muted them and pumped in, p- piped in crowd noise, and they were doing commentary from the studio. Now, this is just a long, boring six-man squash anyway, but when you take out the studio audio, oh, my God, this was dreadful. We'll get to that. Went on and on and Let's on. Let's talk about the dreadfulness It was Mike Samani. Goddamn hideous. Pink trunks. Drier hair than Randy Savage. His hair was a fire hazard. Totally bald on top. And I can only hope that he will be on Raw Monday. I once tweeted, t- tweeted out a picture of this man said he was the jobberest jobber I've ever seen. It's on my account somewhere. Can't find it right now. So about eight hours into this, Nikita has hit a sickle for the win. So they go back to the studio, and Ivan and Crusher are still sitting there. I did like Ivan sitting there with his shirt unbuttoned down to his belly. 
Sure. Hot in Atlanta. He says, I have a... It's a tough, manly Russian. That's true. I have a letter here that a fan has written me. He pulls the letter out of his pocket, and he reads, hate mail. <laughs> it's hate mail. A fan trolled him, said you and your crew should go back to Russia. And here's where... He, I even said it was match five, and Nikita was up three to one. Anyway, they went for a long time, and that was it. It's a match five, but he's up three to one. Yeah, because it's been four. The oh, it is match five. Yes. Okay. Yeah. One way or the other, it's still not it's seven. seven. You're at the fucking finale. The key point is it is not seven. Yes. So Dusty Rhodes joined Shivani for a promo. Oh, my God. Dusty said it feels good as gold, good as punch to be world champion again. Dusty Rhodes is out there and he's wearing jeans I don't even remember what shirt he was wearing. It was nothing to write home about. A giant fucking cowboy hat and sunglasses. He's so fat. <laughs> he looks like such a non-athlete. And he's sitting there telling us about how awesome he is. Yes. That's exactly what happened. He's so awesome. And the title is so awesome. And he is so awesome. Now, keep in mind, he's the baby face. Yeah. Later, the man he beat, Ric Flair, the heel, the biggest heel in the company, supposedly, comes out and talks about how great Dusty is and how Dusty's the man. Uh, yes. So both men were here putting over Dusty. Yes. Crazy. <laughs> Fucking amazing. I'll praise Dusty later, but right here, it was just hilarious. He talked for a long, long, long time about how he started wrestling back when wrestling wasn't cool. You never saw doctors or lawyers say they were wrestling fans until Dusty Rhodes came along. Or Indian Chiefs. Was that in there, too? Well, no, that's a different promo, but... He, he has said that before, yeah. He encouraged all the fans to come down to Atlanta and watch one more cage match, and Ric Flair, if you want to be the man, now you got to beat the man. Please do not gloss over Tony's list of girls who have won the Rock and Roll Express contest. That is next, because they went to break. They came back. Dusty was still out there. I see. So Tony did, in fact, have... I did not write down every name. But it doesn't matter. It was nobody I knew. Well, that's, that's all that matters. The first name, no one you knew. <laughs> I was hoping to hear like Mel Melissa Hyatt. No, that's not a bad guess. Although I will say the first name was Don Wells. I'm assuming not the same Don Wells who was Marianne on Gilligan's Island. And maybe it was. But I don't know. Maybe that was the rib. So a bunch of girls and a few boys won chances to do whatever they're doing the Rock and Roll Express. Hey, listen, we finally got an expression out of Dusty Rose, which was a look of horror and <laughs> hilarity and then he golf clapped he did do a golf clap for these young ladies who would be hanging out with the rock express god bless their souls let's see they plugged i could not believe this when he first said it i thought either they made a mistake or i misheard them but it was confirmed later in the show on this bash show i believe in this bash show in atlanta midnight express and jim Cornette versus the road warriors and baby doll inside a steel cage <laughs> that's right they're all in the ring together how about that? So they show a Road Warriors Midnight Express match. And again, the audio from the live broadcast is muted and they're doing commentary from the studio. This is very important. I had a revelation during this match. So how many times we watched one of these old matches with individuals like the Road Warriors and, you know, Baby Doll in this match slapped Jim Cornette and he took a bump. Or she hit him from behind or something like that. She hit him in the head, yeah. The point of this is, when you see this with the original crowd reactions, the crowds are going so crazy. I, yes. That we talk about how my TV is melting and our ears hurt and all of this. And it's so memorable and it feels so legendary. When they got rid of that crowd noise, this was like a match on Raw. Uh -huh. It was like a total nothing tag team match. And it was the Road Warriors versus the Midnight Express. It just goes to show how important the crowd is and how sad it is that nowadays in 2016, you never get crowds like you got back then. No. Unless you had like John Cena versus The Rock again or something crazy, or, or Steve Austin comes back to wrestle The Rock. You never have anything like this, and man, I couldn't even believe the match I was watching without that crowd. I, I, was, I was half asleep. Did you realize it was the same match? No. Okay. I didn't either. I wonder they, why. They were not pretending it was live. Dusty is saying this match was taped in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they're going and going. And again, without the crowd noise, it's very boring. It's just a tag match. Eaton does some fun bumps. 
Manic Express played great bumbling heels. And then as soon as Animal makes his comeback, they whack him from the tennis racket for the DQ. It's a nothing match. And with, like I say, without the crowd noise, it was very dull. So I had to sit through this whole thing, 10 minutes of not fun. And then when I realized, when maybe it all ran out and punched Cornette, and I said, wait a fucking minute. I Not only was it awful, I've seen it before. Yeah. I was so pissed. Here in 2016. Yeah. In 1986, had I been watching this live, guarantee you, that TV goes off, I find something else to do. That made me so angry. They made me sit through this match a second time. Wow. Well, it wouldn't have been so bad if we would have heard the original crowd reaction. That would have helped. That would have helped immensely. That would have helped. It's like we were inside a beehive. It was insane. All right. Time for easily the best thing on the show. Oh, man. This was the best <laughs> thing in wrestling I've seen in 2016. Jimmy Valiant's wrestling Paul Jones. Number one Paul Jones in the Boogie Woogie Man. And it's a hair versus hair match. Anything goes. or there, no, no, there must be a winner. There must be a winner. Well, I guess anything goes, because Valiant was pretty blatantly using a spike on Jones's head right in front of the ref. So they're both bleeding. You tell me Jimmy Valiant was cheating <laughs> in the was middle of a match. He was the rules. Baby yes. Wow. Never have expected Raging that. Raging Bulls out there. Baron Von Rasky's out there. And uh, Jimmy hits the boogie-woogie elbow, but Baron Von Rasky takes the ref. So Paul Jones goes to put on Baron's loaded glove. But Boogie Wiggy Man is not smarter than him. He has a loaded glove of his own. And they both put the gloves on and they both throw hands and Jimmy hits first. Paul Jones is down. Jimmy covers him. And we're going to have a bald headed geek. But no, the ref is still distracted. So Shaska Watley runs out. He whacks Jimmy with a chair. He puts Jimmy on. Yeah, he puts uh, Paul Jones on top. And Earl Hebner turns around and counts the pinfall. And Paul Jones has defeated Jimmy Valiant in the hair match. Sam Houston, Denny Brown, every B-teamer you can imagine hits this ring to complain about this. Before you talk about Jimmy Valiant, mm-hmm. I just have to say, a couple of weeks ago on a Monday, I was doing Wrestling Observer Live, and I was plugging Raw for that night, and it was 40 minutes into the show when I remembered that the main event was Seth Rollins versus Dean Ambrose for the WWE title. That's right. Because nobody gave a shit that the world title was being defended in a rare match on Raw. Because nobody cares at all about these championships. And one of the reasons why is all of those times that John Cena got fucked on a pay-per-view and he showed up on Raw the next night and he laughed. And he said, ha-ha, titles come and go. And he didn't give a shit about it. And he joked, and he guffawed, and he went on his way. Now, the reason for this is because WWE doesn't want their baby faces to be complainers. They don't want their baby faces to cry. Now, I've argued many times, we watched Saturday night's main event when Hulk Hogan was fucked, ironically, by Earl Hebner, who I believe was the referee in this match right here. Yes. He was fucked by the twin Hebners, and Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan went backstage and cried. He cried tears. He was so angry and sad. And people will say, you know, that worked great for Hulk Hogan. You can't have a babyface cry in 2016. Fine. You have your babyface John Cena come out and do what Jimmy Valiant did here after he was fucked in a match... For weeks and months, he had been talking about bald-headed geeks and what he was going to do to Paul Jones' army. And in the big match, they fucked him, and they were going to shave his head. How did he respond, Vinny? Well, first he had to come, too. He was not cold by this chair shop. His friends had to revive him. Rage and Bull and Sam Houston and all them. And he came to, and as he came back to reality, and it sunk in, my God, I've lost, they're going to shave my head. First, he was despondent. And he dropped to his knees, and he buried his head in his hands, and he went fetal, essentially, and and couldn't move. And a minute or two passed, I said, you know what? I'm a man of my word. And the crowd was pissed. They were chanting, no, no, no. They didn't want to see the stip that he paid for. And Raging Bull had a chair and was threatening the ref. But Jimmy Valiant gets up and he goes to his friends and he just pats them all on the chest and the shoulder and says, I'm mad at my word. It's going to be okay. And he takes a seat 
and they start to shave his head. Mosca, uh, Wat- Watley at ringside is just dancing with glee beside himself. Shaska's strutting outside mm-hmm. in celebration. <laughs> so great. So Jimmy stands there or sits there and he's looking essentially into the camera. Not quite, but essentially. And this haircut took, I don't know, two minutes. And I promise you for those two minutes, Jimmy Valiant didn't blink. And they take those clippers to his head. And as he is staring ahead, first he is enraged. And his eyes are bugging out of his head. And he's turning red. And his mouth is all grimaced. And they start to shave. And about halfway through, the rage subsides. And he is heartbroken. He can't believe it has come to this. His lovely golden hair is gone. And then towards the end, a look of peace came over his face. It's done. It happened. Can't deny it. It's it it's a it is in the past. But at the same time, you can also see in his face, there shall be a reckoning. That's right. <laughs> he went through the stages of death. He did. That is what he did when he sat here in Only this chair. Never made it to acceptance. He was so goddamn devastated, but he was a man of his word. And while he was devastated, he did not complain, but he sat there and he was so furious at the beginning that he was shaking with rage. And then, as you noted, the shaking with rage gave away to a look of calm, at which point you, the viewer, knew this man is going to fuck these guys (laughs) up. And where is my fucking wallet? This story is not done yet. There is more to tell. He is not tucking his tail between his legs and going home to cry. No. He did not make this a useless stipulation. He did not belittle the stipulation. He did not laugh at the stipulation. But at the same time, he didn't cry about it. No. He accepted it. Uh, By the end. Very briefly. Yes. But then you just knew these men will die at the hands of Jimmy Valiant. The boogie woogie man. And I will pay for this. (laughs) So they were done and he knelt and began to pick up his blonde... His blonde hair off the mat, as wretched a soul as there could ever be. So this is unbelievably great, and there was actually more. <laughs> That's what it followed. Paul Jones. <laughs> Before you <we> start, <laughs> like a year ago, six months to a year ago, Bill Apter introduced his interview segment. He talked to Magnum TA for about six and a half hours. And said, we'll be back next week. And he was never back again. That's right. They said, we're going to do this every week. <laughs> and he's never and seen after the again. first one, that was it. <laughs> inexplicably, he's back it was, here. Well, yeah, this was inexplicable. It disappearing same- was not inexplicable. Well, no, that, that made sense. The fact it was back here on the same set. They kept it around just in case. And you know what was so great about it? The first time, they let him go three hours. <laughs> and then when it was over, it was just like, dude... One and done. I know we said every week, but one and done. This time, they gave him two minutes, and it was over. And they cut away. (laughs) So his guest was Paul Jones. Paul Jones. The perfect guest for this, by the way. (laughs) That is for sure. He could not stop laughing at his win. No. Before they come back from commercial, before they even went to commercial, Tony Schiavone looks into the camera, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, Paul Jones gloats after the break. That's right. I'm like, that's how you're keeping these fans around for the next fucking segment. That's right. And they came back and sure as shit, as advertised, Paul Jones gloated. Oh, he did. He laughed and he cackled and he howled and he was enjoying himself. And after after tried to ask him like one question and Joe shouts, don't interrupt me. I'm just happy. I'm sitting here. I'm free. Boogie Woogie Man, Jimmy Valiant. He's out of my hair. And he laughed again. And he was like, mid-sentence, and they cut right back to Shivani. Oh, yeah. And it was over. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but we never saw either of these men again. No. All right. Shivani's next guests were the Road Warriors. Now, what I liked about this was everyone was doing these promos. There were no matches going on, so everyone was the street gear. Flair came out in a suit later. We talked about Dusty's outfit. Uh, the Russians were there in just, like, polos and, 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 and slacks. The Road Warriors' street gear was their makeup. Studded collars, vests with no shirts, and blue jeans. I can believe that. It's a hawking animal roam the, earth, roam the earth. I love that Animal is doing a promo, and all of a sudden he just ran out of material, and he goes, Tell him, Paul! That was it. He was done for the day. That was the advantage of having three guys there to do promos. That's right. 
I remember many, many, many years ago, like like early 90s, Sting and Lex were doing a promo. And Sting says his piece. And he's got, you know, 30 or 40 seconds, whatever. And he runs down Ric Flair or the Horseman, whoever he's feeding with at the time. And he finishes up. And he says, tell him, Lex. And Lex says, that's right, Stinger, you and me, we're together, we're on the same page. And he gets like five seconds in, and his mind goes blank. And all I can think to say is, tell him, Sting. <laughs> and Sting shoots him and look like you, fucker. And then Sting picks up the ball and carries him home. But somebody will find that promo again. Anyway, Road Warriors here, they ran down every tag team in the world. They vowed, or vowed, they bragged about winning Tag Team of the Year three times in a row. Vowed to win it a fourth time in a row. So they're going to win the World Tag Team titles for the Minute Express, beat the Russians, keep their six-man belts. And while they respected Dusty Rhodes, and while he was the only man they had ever teamed with, they also wanted to challenge him for that world title because that meant more money. Ric Flair joined Shivani. He admitted it was very strange to be there as announced as anything but world champion. But he was still Slick Rick, still Space Mountain. And in his mind and everyone else's, he was still the best wrestler in the world. He said, no excuses. There's no bad luck. I did not slip under the banana peel. I had no injuries. I did not trip over a ref. I did not trip over a ref. I got beat by a better man on that given night. Now, Dusty, you got to show you can do it again. And he goes off about how great he is, all the matches he's won. He claimed that in his career, I believe, his win-loss record was 3,115 and 6. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Mookie, please verify. I suspect he was lying. Well, what made me sad is he goes, it'll never reach double digits. Yes. And I was like, just wait, dude. <laughs> just wait till you hit WC. Just wait till you meet Eric Bischoff. Oh, it will. So Shivani asked, you know, you were you were defending this world title in every basho. Was the schedule too much for you? And Flair would not have this. No. No excuses. I defended that world title in every show, and Dusty Rhodes was on every show wrestling tough matches as well. Let me say something amazing about Dusty, about how great he was. Not even so much in the match itself, because the match, they just showed clips of it. But to set this up, you have to realize that Dusty Rhodes was coming out every single week and talking about how he was the better man, and he was going to beat Ric Flair, and he was going to win the World Heavyweight title at the Great American Bash Tour 1986. Let me tell you how the finish went. Because... Maybe I was the only one that thought this was so goddamn great, but I don't care. They're having this match, and they're going back and forth. And in the middle of it, I don't know if Flair went for a suplex or whatever, it doesn't matter, but Dusty Rhodes turns it into a small package. And the referee drops down, and he counts one, two, three. Dusty Rhodes is beating Ric Flair clean in the middle, and he has won the world heavyweight title. The moment the referee's hand hits the mat for the third time, Dusty stands up as calmly as possible. He does not leap to his feet. He gets a small package, and he stands up, and he calmly looks around, as relaxed as anyone you've ever seen, and it is as if he said, boom, what Basically, did I tell you? And a- then, and then, suddenly it hits him. Holy fuck, I just won the world title for the third time. And then he has this gigantic celebration. And the way this man sold that win, where at first it was just, he proved he was right. There was, I mean, I mean, there was, it was like he didn't realize he'd won the championship, but just realized he had pinned Ric Flair yeah. because he knew he was a better man. Mm. And hey, look, everybody, I, what did I tell you? But then the gravity of the situation that he was now a three time world heavyweight champion struck him and he was overcome with emotion and just had the best celebration. You say it was relaxed. That's not exactly the right word. First of all. The, the way it happened, too, it was a wrestling hold out of nowhere, and he pinned him. It wasn't, wasn't uh, neither one of them was near death. So it made sense that he would not be lying on the back, uh, lying on the mat in exhaustion. He stood up, and for about four or five seconds, you know what it was, actually? When we talked about Keith Lee and Shane Taylor in ROH, and Keith Lee hit his big dive and then jumped up and was very, very proud of himself, that's what Dusty did here. Yes. He jumped up, arrogance, uh, pride. And uh, Defiance, that's the other word I was looking for. He had proven, well, mostly Ric Flair. He shoved it all up Ric Flair's ass like he said he would. And then, yes, he was the world goddamn champion, and he had a giant party. All his friends hit the cage. 
and you know, Ronnie Garvin's out there, and Magnum's out there, and all the baby faces. The flare just disappears. It's ah, fuck, he leaves. And there's a big bearded guy, maybe the biggest guy in the ring. I'm trying to figure out who it is. And Flair is doing commentary over in the studio. He's talking about how much it sickens him to watch Dutty celebrate with all his friends. And he says, you know, I got to say one thing. I am not a country music fan, but I got a lot of respect for David Allen Coe. And that's who it was. <laughs> David Allen Coe in the ring with Dusty Rhodes. And this, this Flair said that the star of this magnitude was in the ring. This shows how important the Great American Bash was. So Dusty had a massive party. He's on the ropes, celebrating with the belt and waving to the fans. And they're all going ballistic. And they go back to the studio and Flair says, listen, Dusty's a great wrestler. This is a great roster. He puts over everyone on the roster and says, my, my ego will not allow this to stand. I need my title back. Then he says, the best feeling in the world is when you're in an airport or in the bar or on the street and you get recognized and they say, how's it going, champ? That's right. You know, they always say the best gimmicks are yourself turned up to 11. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is the truth, everyone. If you see Ric Flair, say, how's it going, champ? You'll make his day. So he puts over the company again. He buries the Atlanta Braves. He buries their announcers. I don't really know why. <laughs> then he left. He said, I'm going back to the stadium to regain my title. And I have not checked. I did not look it up since he said this, but I'm pretty sure he did. So the Andersons are out there. They're there to hype up Tully Blanchard's tape fist match against Ronnie Garvin. Garvin has apparently put his career on the line. Let's jump to the chase here. They talked for nine years. Yeah. Arn sat there looking exactly like Walter from the Big Lebowski after the dude had said something offensive to him. Ole Anderson talked and 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 bored the shit out of me until the very end when he lost his fucking mind and I suddenly realized this guy's a goddamn great promo. He's amazing. What the hell took him so long? The last minute of this was incredible. The first 50 sucked. There was a point when Dusty was out earlier and Dusty had been out there, you know, between his promo and then calling the match. He was out there a good 20 minutes and he got bored. You could tell he was bored. The Andersons were bored here. There was a point where they started tripping over each other and disagreeing with each other. And then they kind of said, Jesus Christ, what are we doing? We're on TV. <laughs> kind of picked it back up. They showed Ronnie Garvin wrestling Black Bart for about 40 years. He had a cheat to Blair win. Blair did, in fact, win the title back yep. on August 9, 1986. Mm -hmm. He pointed out there was a double standard. They liked it when Garvin broke the rules, but the horsemen broke the rules. They were bad guys. And uh, eventually it was great, and I think that's about it and out of this. Man, Flair wins the title. He holds it for 412 days and then loses it to rugged Ronnie Garvin. A long time later. Yeah. <laughs> I still have a year and a half to go. God damn. <laughs> this is your favorite. <laughs> slow build, baby. This is a slow build. <laughs> That's a slow build, all right. So Buddy Landell and Bill Dundee are in the studio cutting a promo. I've seen a lot of stills of Bill Dundee. I've probably seen a match or two. I don't think I've ever actually heard him speak before, which is amazing. I loved it when he began and he says, hello, Tony. What's your name? That's what he said. <laughs> then he said it was Tony Schiavone. He said it sounded like a disease or something, and he had a hearty laugh. So Bill Dundee... Born in Scotland, raised in Australia, and had been working for years in Memphis. That explains everything. It does, because we were trying to listen <laughs> to promo. trying to figure out what the fuck is he... Word what accent is this? From one, his accent would change totally from one word to the next, and it was so confusing. He's so lucky he doesn't have a podcast, because he'd have 8,000 geeks telling him he's pronouncing every word wrong. Yes, because he's screwing something up to some people in some part of the world. So Landell's out there and he's just got his 1980s, you know, sports casual look. Dundee's got a satin purple jumpsuit like Elvis. <laughs> Dude, we had fake Ric Flair and fake Elvis doing a promo together. Yes. On NWA World Championship Wrestling in 1986. <laughs> they were pretty great. Dundee especially was great. He was a great little act. They, they, he, they, they had energy, that's for sure. They, they had more energy than anyone else in the show. So they were doing commentary of Landell doing a squash match on George South. This also went forever. I did like when Landell had a dropkick on the floor. and They're talking about how great it was. I'm trying to think of why would you do a dropkick on the floor, which involves you landing on the floor. Well, the other guy lands on the floor, too, and you actually kicked him to the floor. Sure. I'd rather land on my... Well, anyway. 
So eventually Landell won with the corkscrew elbow in the figure four, and they ran their mouths for a while. They were actually pretty good. They were one of the highlights of the show. Not the Boogie Woogie Man highlight, but among but better than most. And then Shivani was joined by the Kansas Jayhawks. This is like it. This is seriously. It, it is the it's the post wrestlemania post WrestleMania era where they every you know the week or two after Mania they used to bring everyone up. Still do kind of. This is the is the time after the bash. Let's get some new faces in here. And Bobby Jaggers mm-hmm. and Dutch Mantel, who they build as quote from the southern part of the country. Yes, <laughs> very specific. They threatened to wrap a bullwhip around Jim Cornette's hiney. Yeah, that's what I got out of this. <laughs> that and was nothing there. else. That was in there. They it was they were running down Midnight Express and Jim Cornette, but they're doing so as heels. I thought so. Anyway, they were threatening to, to attack him with a whip. Anyway, they go to commercial and they come back and there's Dick Murdoch. Oh my god! All right, let me talk about Dick Murdoch for a while. First off, <laughs> Dick Murdoch was forty years old here. He'd been in the business for twenty one years. He looked physically 60. <laughs> he had nothing resembling a physique. Oh, no. Big belly, skinny arms. The fucker could work. Oh, my God. The arm drags he was doing. He's in there with Bill Mulkey. Yes. In a squash match yes. that goes like two minutes. And it was it was like the best wrestling I'd seen forever. He mentions that he'd been up there in the WWF. He said WWF. Don't lock them Russians. They talk about how... I don't know what the hell they talked about. But the point is, they (laughs) mention he's a top five wrestler here in the NWA in 1986. And I'm like, I've been watching this fucking show for how long? Now, all of a sudden, this guy walks in, he's a top five wrestler. He proved it in the match with Bill Mulkey. And in fact, they did move him right into a feud with Ric Flair. And if I don't get some fucking Ric Flair Dick Murdoch matches on this NWA World Championship Wrestling show in the next few months, I'm going to be pissed off. Yeah, Dick Murdoch was awesome. Dick Murdoch was unbelievably awesome. Just doing arm drags with Bill Mulkey. <laughs> and then he goes to win with a brain buster. It's a very delayed brain buster, and he just is the old school. That's why it was so great. Yeah. We see these brain busters now where you lift the guy up and you like drive his head down to the mat, which is cool in a different way. But his was like, you lift the guy up and you hold him up there and then you bonk, drump him right on his head. Yeah. It was a different kind of awesome. Yes. It was like the slow drop. It was... <laughs> Yes, I mean, we can, we can break down the mechanics of it, and guys now when they do it, they basically almost jump forward and fall on their backs. He went straight down onto his ass and then dropped the guy backwards. But he's talking about how he learned it from Killer Carl Cox. As far as, as, far as he's concerned, nobody drops him right on their head like he does. And they brought up Jimmy Garvin's Brain Buster, and he said he knew Garvin. He hadn't seen Garvin's Brain Buster yet, but he was confident his was the best. He runs down all the heels in the company. He says he's going to fight Arn Anderson for the TV title in Los Angeles. Then he starts talking about the U.S. and how he's a he's a Marine himself, spent some time in the service. And if, if Russia is so great, why aren't the Russians there? Then he talks about how he and Dusty is proud of his old partners, that we were the greatest tag team ever, even greater than Bruiser and Crusher. And then it just ended. <laughs> that was the end. So it just stopped. You know, Dick Murdoch just, he's sitting there, no physique, as I noted. He's wearing a trucker hat. Like a blue Yeah, we didn't talk enough about hat. that. But you know what? He was such a good talker that he convinced you that no matter what he looked like, he'd whip your ass. That's, That's true. the key. That's the magic. Okay. 